Hi everybody, welcome to Dr. Manny's YouTube Learn Shops. This is part two, adult electrocardiograms. As I mentioned previously in part one, this Learn Shop is intended for nurses and any other healthcare provider who monitors adult cardiac rhythms. And these Learn Shops will follow a specific methodology in a sequential process. But the primary objective is to assess common and uncommon adult ECG arrhythmias and dysrhythmias. The learning objectives for this session are to review the electrocardiographic recording paper, calculate heart rate, use a systematic approach to ECG analysis, one of many, criteria, review for normal PQRST complex, and then review selected technical ECG problems that may occur. Let's review the knowledge again. Which of the following is the normal pacemaker of the heart? A, B, C, or D? The correct answer is A, the SA node. Which of the following are components of the conduction system of the heart? A, B, C, or D? The correct answer is all of the above. Which of the following statements represents the P wave? A, B, C, or D? The correct answer is atrial depolarization, D. Which of the following statements relates to the sympathetic nervous system? A, B, C, or D? The correct answer is D, all of the above. Which of the following then is normal about the heart rate? A, B, C, or D? The correct answer is, of course, A. Six, which of the following relates to the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest of the digestive system? A, B, C or D? The correct answer is all of them relate to the parasympathetic nervous system. Which of the following statements then pertain to the standard ECG leads? As mentioned in part one, we have A, B, C or D. And the correct answer for standard ECG leads is all of the above. Which of the following relates to sinus tachycardia then? Is it A, B, C, or none of them? The correct answer is none of them. Which of the following connect to atrial fibrillation? Is it A, B, C, or all of them? And the correct answer pertaining to atrial fibrillation is all of the above apply. Which of the following relate to premature ventricular complexes, ectopics, contractions, whatever terminology that you choose to use? A, B, C, or D? The correct answer is D. All of them apply. Okay, let's see what you remember. What's the following ECG anomaly? Premature ventricular complexes. This one? Supraventricular tachycardia. How about this one? This is coarse ventricular fibrillation. How about this one? I'm sure all of you will get this. This has to be asystole. What about this one? This is atrial fibrillation with a controlled ventricular response. So now let's look at the ECG recording paper. And the ECG recording paper really just records two things. It records time along the horizontal axis and it records voltage on the vertical axis. In time, seconds or milliseconds, voltage, 
in millivolts, but we tend to use millimeters in relation to size. Because size really is voltage. The scale details, one big square has got 25 small squares in it, but on the horizontal axis, it's equal to 0.2 seconds or 200 milliseconds. On the vertical axis, it's equal to five millimeters. A small square then on the horizontal axis is equal to 0.04 seconds or 40 milliseconds. On the vertical axis, one millimeter or 0.1 of a millivolt. Now, as indicated previously in the pediatric course, there are recording rules. Well, I just call them recording rules. Paper speed has to be set on your machine at 25 millimeters per second. And if it's set at 25 millimeters per second, then every small square is equal to 0.04 of a second or 40 milliseconds. And every big square then is equal to 0.2 of a second or 200 milliseconds. The calibration marker must be set at one millivolt which is the same as 10 millimeters. Otherwise, what you record will be incorrect. So the paper speed is set at 25 millimeters per second. Look at the rhythm strip down the bottom. It says there, 25 millimeters per second. And if it's set at 25 millimeters per second, all the small squares are equal to 0.04 of a second. And all the large squares are equal to 0 0.2 of a second. The calibration marker is important as well. Have a look at the bottom on the rhythm strip. 10 millimeters is the same as one millivolt because you can change these settings, whether it's the paper speed or the calibration marker, you can change them. But typically normal is set at 10 millimeters or one millivolt and then the size of the ECG is accurate for your patient. However, sometimes it will need to be set at five millimeters or 0 0.5 of a millivolt because the ECG is too big. It's jumping off the paper. It's huge, as you see sometimes with cardiomegaly in an adult or with very, very thin adults because they have very little subcutaneous tissue. Or the ECG may be really, really, really small. So therefore this can be doubled to 25, 20 millimeters uh, or two millivolts. And this can sometimes happen with very obese patients. They've got too much tissue for the current to get through or patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease because their chest is full of air, emphysema, chronic bronchiolitis. However, have a look on the rhythm strip. It says there what the calibration marker settings are. And on that rhythm strip that we're looking at now, it's 10 millimeters, which is the same as one millivolt. So if we're measuring ECG heart rates, we can use a number of different techniques. But what you have to remember is that you've got markers at the top of the ECG paper, see the black lines? And the markers are typically at three second intervals or 15 large squares. If you take a six second rhythm strip, You've got 30 large squares and this can help you determine heart rate as you'll see. This is called the times 10 method and the times 10 method I tend to advocate for because it's the simplest method and this can be used for both irregular and regular heart rhythms and what you do is you count the number of ECG complexes in a rhythm strip and then multiply by 10. So for example, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Between the markers at the top of the ECG paper, as you can see, which is 30 squares, 30 large squares. And then you multiply it by 10. And this will give you an approximate rate. And in this situation, the heart rate is approximately 70 beats per minute. And this works for irregular and regular heart rhythms. All the other ones do not. They only work for regular heart rhythms. So this is the 300 square method. 
and this is for normal or slower heart rates. So you count the number of big squares between two cardiac cycles or two ECG complexes and divide it into 300 because there are 300 large squares in a one minute rhythm strip. So we're counting them there now, one, two, three, four, five. Five into 300 is 60. So the heart rate is approximately 60 beats per minute. You can also use the 1500 square method, which is used for very, very rapid heart rates. And this is where you count the number of small squares between two cardiac cycles or two ECG complexes and divide it into 1500. Because there are 1500 small squares in a one minute rhythm strip. So we count them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There are 10 small squares between two ECG complexes in this rhythm strip. So there will 10 into 15 is 150. So the heart rate is approximately 150 beats per minute. The 1500 square method. So let's review. You can do some work. What's the heart rate here? Well, the heart rate is 50 beats per minute because there are five cardiac cycles or ECG complexes in a six second rhythm strip. What's the heart rate here? Well, the heart rate is 150 beats per minute because there are 15 cardiac cycles, fast to begin with, then slow down. However, that doesn't matter. The rate is 150 beats per minute. Look at this one here. What's the heart rate in a six second rhythm strip? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 70 beats per minute. Very accurate, very simple, not hard to do. What's the heart rate in this rhythm strip? And remember, you only count the complexes between the three lines, or in actual fact, the two outer lines, which is the six second rhythm strip. The heart rate is 100 beats per minute because there are 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 cardiac cycles. If we want to interpret an ECG, it's always good to use a system for everything. You use a system for everything. And there are a number of different systems that you can use. This is the one that I'm advocating. But you can use whatever that you that you can use whatever system that you choose as long as you use it. I always go by the right patient, date, age, indication, medications, and clinical diagnosis. That's the first thing. Identify the patient correctly, and then the other components in that identification. Then you've got, as we mentioned previously, the right calibration, 10 millimeters or one millivolt, right paper speed, 25 millimeters per second. Unless there's an indication to do it differently, which again, the physician would have to order. What's the heart rate? We're not determining what the heart rate actually is. We're just determining whether it's slow, normal, fast, or very fast. If it's normal, you're not gonna worry about it. If it's slow or fast or very fast, you might be concerned. What's the rhythm? We're not saying sinus rhythm. We're saying, is it regular or irregular? If it's regular, then you might not be that concerned about it. If it's irregular, you might be concerned about it. What's the electrical axis and lead to? Well, we're not determining the actual degrees. We're just saying here that lead to is normally positive in an adult because they're left ventricular dominant. So it's typically positive, not negative. If it was negative, you might be concerned about it or you might realize that you might have the leads on the wrong way. You always look to see, is there a P wave in lead two? There must be a P wave in lead two. And the P wave is always positive. Otherwise, something 
could be wrong. The P wave is there and it's always positive. If it's negative or missing, something is really wrong with your patient. You look at the PR interval. The PR interval should be normal, short or prolonged. If it's short or prolonged, something could be wrong. You look at the QRS complex and the QRS complex in Li2 is always positive. It's always narrow. It's never negative and it's never wide. Otherwise, something could be wrong. You look at the ST segment. An ST segment is always isoelectric, which means not positive or negative. Positive means elevated. Negative means depressed. Then you look to see the T wave. And the T wave is always positive. It's not negative, it's not tall, and it's not flat. If it is, something could be wrong. Then you look at the QT segment. And the QT segment represents total repolarization and depolarization time of the ventricle. However, we'll be discussing that later. However, the QT segment should be normal. Not short, and it shouldn't be prolonged. Otherwise, something could be wrong. I haven't mentioned the U wave, and I won't. If it's important to you, you can review the U wave. Now let's look at the normal PQRST criteria. So the, the normal PQRST criteria are as follows. The P wave represents atrial depolarization and normally it is between 0.06 to 0.12 seconds. Anything longer than 0.12 seconds is potentially problematic. The amplitude basically means it's less than three small squares in height, but it has to be more than 1.5 millimeters in height. And the axis is the same as the QRS complex, typically between zero and plus 90 degrees because of left ventricular dominance. The PR interval, also known as the PQ interval, represents atrial and AV nodal and hisnodal depolarization, and in an adult, it's typically between 0.12 and 0.20 seconds, 120 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds. Anything longer or shorter may be problematic. The QRS complex represents ventricular depolarization, and it's narrow. So its duration is between 0.04, one small square, and one and a half small squares, 0.10 seconds. And the amplitude, as a general rule, should be less than 25 millimeters in height. But that depends. But as a general rule, that's acceptable. And the axis is from zero to plus 90 degrees in a left ventricular dominant patient, which a normal adult is. The ST segment, represents early ventricular repolarization, as we said, and it's typically isoelectric, which means neutral. It's not positive, it's not negative. However, if it's not isoelectric, then it's allowed to be less than one millimeter in amplitude above or below the, 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 um, the isoelectric baseline. Anything more than one millimeter above or below is considered potentially pathological. The T wave represents ventricular repolarization and in the standard leads, it's typically less than five millimeters in height, but more than one eighth of the previous R wave. And it's got an asymmetrical shape. It sort of goes up slowly and then goes down a little bit faster. In the precordial leads, which I haven't mentioned here now, it's typically double but it depends on the precordial lead, whether it's V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. But we'll be looking at that in the advanced ECG learn shops if you choose to follow through. 
The QT interval represents total time for ventricular depolarization, repolarization, and as a general rule, it's about 0 0.35 to 0 0.44 seconds. Anything less than that, or more prolonged than that, can potentially be problematic and dangerous. The QTC just represents, the C represents calculated. Because again, when we look at the electrophysiologists, they calculate the QTC interval according to heart rate. However, for us, the duration is typically the same, 0 0.35 to 0 0.44 seconds. However, this can vary in infancy. In an adult, it doesn't typically. But review the pediatric ECG learn shop. When it comes to recording the ECG, often there are technical problems, which means problems that you encounter when you record the ECG. I've just included three here. One is a wandering baseline, which is to do with movement or loose connections, or you've connected the electrodes incorrectly. Muscular tremor, also referred to as somatic tremor, the patient's shivering, or they could be moving again or they could have Parkinson's disease, or they could be cold, or they could be nervous or restless. Then you've got AC interference, which is coming from faulty electrical equipment, which means you need to call your bioengineer. Because you can't interpret this ECG the way it is. That's the end of part two. Thank you. If you found it of any value, move on to part three.